This episode of HCC 788 brought to you in part by Nonstop Pop. Nonstop Pop. Definitely an actual comic strip, and not just an extensive enterprise's front for a cartoonish supervillain's attempts to take over your world, fools! <laughs> Pardon us? Yes, definitely a comic. Everybody, go to Co Commander Seven Eight Eight. Here, it's time for another vintage GI Joe toy review, and my review of Lobotomax was rough. I'm not gonna lie, but the truth is, there was a good amount of science fiction in GI Joe, and it didn't just happen in the '90s. It was in the '80s too. So this week, we're gonna talk about. Woo! I just got a really tingly feeling. Ah! Where are my legs? How am I still standing without legs? But What's happening to me? Where's the rest of me? Excuse me, sir? Are you Hooded Cobra Commander 788? Yes, I am, but this is a really bad time. I've got a slight problem here. I have something for you. We've had this letter since 1982 with specific instructions to deliver it to you at this very spot at this exact time. Sign here. You know, we've been taking bets at the office that you wouldn't be here. I guess I lost again. Yeah, thanks. Move two steps to the left. What? Not that, Doc. Doc Brown! What? Not that... Doc, what are you doing here? Hoodie, I've come back from the future to help save you and G.I. Joe. <gasps> Great Scott, it's already happening! What? What's happening to me? Why am I disappearing? It's just as I feared. Older G.I. Joe fans are disappearing. If something isn't done soon, you will completely vanish, as will G.I. Joe. Ah! This is horrible! What can I do? You can't do it on your own. According to the historical records, this week you're going to review sci-fi. Well, that was the plan, but maybe I need to go to the hospital instead, since half my body's disappeared. The problem is, you're stuck in the past. You represent nostalgia. Your love for vintage G.I. Joe is not enough to help it survive. To save yourself and G.I. Joe, you need the help of a reviewer that can take G.I. Joe forward. To the future! The future? Now that means I need a reviewer who looks at modern G.I. Joe. I know just who to call. Joe Fan 82 reporting in. Joe Fan, look what happened to me! Oh, that looks uncomfortable. This is exactly why I don't do green screen. Doc says I need your help to stop me and G.I. Joe from disappearing! I thought Doc was African American. That's what I'm saying! Not that Doc! Listen closely! You must follow my instructions to the letter! First, you must review the vintage sci-fi action figure. Your nostalgic perspective is the first element. Then, you must put sci-fi in the time machine and send him to JoeFan82 in the future! All the way to the year 2016. His modern perspective is the second element. Once your two elements merge, everything will be fine. Wait a minute, is that a thunder machine? Pretty cool, huh? You made a time machine out of a thunder machine? I figure if you're gonna make a time machine, why not do it with some style? Doc, come on, focus! 
focus. I'm disappearing here. Oh, right, right. You get this review done. I'll see you at the end of the video. In the meantime, try not to completely disappear. JoeFan82, are you ready to do your part? Ready. Hootie, are you ready? Ah! Okay then, let's go! I've got to get this review done while I still have hands. HCC788 presents Sci-Fi. This is Sci-Fi, G.I. Joe's Laser Trooper from 1986. He was first available in 1986 and was also available in 1987. He was discontinued for the year 1988 and there was no direct replacement in 1988. He was, of course, the successor to G.I. Joe's first laser rifle trooper, Flash, from 1982. Let's address the elephant in the room. Sci-Fi is wearing a very bright neon green uniform and you might wonder why a toy line that was military based would release an action figure that is so aggressively non-military. Well, there was a reason for this. The bright neon green was used because there was a trend in toys at the time toward bright colors. So this is an example where G.I. Joe was a trend follower rather than a trend setter. And in my opinion, that's always when they lost focus and went off the rails. This figure's code name, Sci-Fi, is of course short for science fiction. And that really does describe the inspiration for this figure. It's not really military at all. It's purely science fiction. The sci-fi action figure wasn't always going to be called sci-fi. There were some other names that were floated around for him. Uh, in Marvel Age number 34, there's a section to meet the new Joes, uh, and sci-fi appears on page 18, uh, but they're not calling him sci-fi. They're using his prototype name of Hotspot. Uh, they even have a different file name for him, Edwin P. Rohr. There was a second version of sci-fi released in 1991, and they gave him a gray jump jumpsuit, which looked better. So if you liked lasers in G.I. Joe, and to be honest, I've never been a fan, but if you liked lasers, you could still have those, but at least the figure was not in a bad color. But then in 1993 and 1994, they went right back to crazy colors for sci-fi, so his foray into sanity was brief. Let's look at sci-fi's accessories, and let's start with his weapon first. He had what the contents of the card called an XH-86 LLOM beam laser rifle. The rifle is black and it has a little knob here and that is to connect the standard black rubber hose, the standard G.I. Joe connector, just plugs right in there. Um, and it has sculpted on here what looks like a magazine. So you could easily imagine this as a conventional assault rifle. It's not based on any real world weapon that I know of. I haven't been able to find any reference for what LLOM might stand for, so we'll just assume this is some super powerful laser rifle. He has that long black rubber hose. This is standard on a lot of G.I. Joe action figures. And the other end connects to his backpack. This backpack is pretty cool. It has the knob for the connector. It has some sculpted techno detail on both sides. And it has these teeth on the side here and you can use these to store the laser rifle. It looks like you're intended to attach the rifle by the barrel like that. And now Sci-Fi can carry his laser rifle on his backpack. And that's nice um, I like weapons storage like this. I wish more G.I. Joe figures had features like this. Let's take a look at a brief history of laser rifles in the G.I. Joe toy line up to sci-fi in 1986. And I'm excluding laser pistols like the ones that came with Destro and Tomax and Zamot. First, in 1982, we had Flash with his XMLR-1A laser rifle. And it had a wire that connected to the power source in the backpack. Also in 1982, we had the jump jet pack, which included a laser rifle, and that also had a wire that connected to the pack. In 1983, that was reissued and Grand Slam carried that laser rifle. Then in 1983, we had the Arctic Trooper Snow Job with his XMLR-3A laser rifle, and this was an upgrade from Flash's XMLR-1A. As you can see with this one, there is no connector to a power pack. It looks more like a traditional rifle, and this rifle became the standard laser rifle rifle in the G.I. Joe animated series. Then in 1984 we had the Baroness with her high density laser rifle and that looked a lot like a sniper rifle. This laser rifle, like Sci-Fi's, has something that looks like a magazine and like Snow Jobs, it does not have a wire that connects to a power source. Then in 1986 with Sci-Fi we go back to the laser rifle with the wires. He has a wire that connects to the power source in the backpack. Let's look at the articulation on Sci-Fi. He had the articulation that was standard for 
1986 G.I. Joe action figures. He could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow and a swivel at the bicep. Uh, the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt to design and color of sci-fi and we've already addressed this. He's wearing very bright neon green. He has some spots of black but he's also wearing a lot of silver uh, so he's very poorly camouflaged. I would not call this figure design futuristic because I would assume soldiers in the future would still prefer not to be shot so they probably would prefer a subdued color scheme rather than this bright neon green and silver. Let's take a look at sci-fi's head. He has a green and silver non-removable helmet and there are some sculpted on non-removable helmets in G.I. Joe that I think are fine but usually that is a problem for me. I want to be able to remove those helmets. He has a black visor. This helmet design is very reminiscent of Robocop. I think that's been pointed out before but uh, sci-fi was released before the Robocop movie so Robocop could not be a direct influence on sci-fi. On his chest he has that bright green jumpsuit and a silver chest plate with some green stripes. He has some black stripes on the shoulders and that silver chest plate uh, reminds me a bit of Grand Slam so that's a little bit of a throwback. His arms are also in that bright green color. He has a couple pockets on the upper arms and he has some sculpted on elbow pads but they are unpainted. I think these would have looked nice if they had painted them even if they had gone with silver. I think that would have looked pretty good. As they are they are just unpainted details and that's kind of a problem for me. On his forearms he has a couple black devices I don't know what and a pair of black gloves. On his waist he has a very basic black belt, some black pouches, and a silver belt buckle. His legs are interesting. We have that bright green jumpsuit, of course, uh, but we also have these pockets on the front of his thighs, and we have these black cartridges, and it looks like those are supposed to be magazines for his laser rifle, and I think that's all right. I like it when they ha there's a coordination between the sculpting on the action figure and the accessories. We have a bit of black padding that runs down the inside of his thighs. There is some random sculpted detail on the thighs. I'm not really sure what those are supposed to be. Uh, then he has some very tall silver boots, very science fiction looking silver boots, and they have knee pads, but they're just very minimal knee pads. They just barely go up above the knee. These silver boots kind of remind me of Ziggy Stardust. These really should be on a glam rock star. They just need high heels. Let's take a look at Sci-Fi's file card. His file card has his faction as G.I. Joe. We have a portrait of Sci-Fi here, although we don't really get to see his face. What is not under his helmet is obscured by his rifle. His code name is Sci-Fi and he is the Laser Trooper. His final name is Seymour P. Fine. His primary military specialty is infantry. His secondary military specialty is electronics. His birthplace is Geraldine, Montana and his grade is E4. This paragraph says Sci-Fi lives in a slow motion world. He takes everything real easy and he's never in a hurry to get anywhere or do anything. But that's what it takes to be a laser rifleman. At a range of two and a half miles the impact spot of a laser light will jump 100 feet for every one thousandth of an inch movement at the source. That spot has got to be held on target long enough to burn through that source. Otherwise, it's no more harmful than a warm breeze. To be honest, this sounds like it's describing a weapon that is pretty impractical. A laser rifle is going to be pretty much useless at long range. If you're going to hit something with it, you're going to have to hit something up close. However, you could use the laser to blind the enemy, just flash it in the enemy's eyes, even if you can't hold it steady enough to burn through the target, uh, you could use it in that respect. Down here we have a quote. It says, when Sci-Fi braces his weapon and sights in on a target, he becomes a rock. No discernible movement of any kind. Birds perch on top of his helmet. He transcends mere stillness to another plane of immobility. You don't even see the trigger finger move. It's like he wills that beam of light to stab the darkness. There you have it. America's movable action soldier does his job by not moving. Sci-Fi made some appearances in G.I. Joe Media. In the cartoon series, he first appeared in Arise Serpentor Arise Part 1, but he didn't have a speaking role in that episode. He got the most focus in the episode titled My Brother's Keeper. In that episode, Sci-Fi is assigned to a mission at a science fiction convention. That episode taught us some valuable lessons, such as science fiction fans are weird, science fiction writers hate their fans, and apparently disabled people are a-holes. Hey, knowing is half the battle, right? They left that out of the PSA. He's had a hard time using these designated laser troopers because in the cartoon, every
everybody used lasers. All troopers were laser troopers. So there wasn't really anything special about sci-fi. In the G.I. Joe comic book published by Marvel Comics, sci-fi first appeared in issue number 74, and he had a fair number of appearances thereafter. He was in the very next issue, number 65, which focused on the Defiant Space Shuttle. He reappeared late in the series with the introduction of Star Brigade. Looking at this figure overall, sci-fi is exactly the opposite of what I like about G.I. Joe. He is, as his name suggests, science fiction, and he's in the brightest of bright colors. Earlier laser rifle troopers also had bright colors, but they were smart enough to tamper it with more traditional military colors. In 1986, G.I. Joe took on a decidedly science fiction direction. They introduced Serpentor, the cloned Cobra Emperor. They introduced Bats, a robot army. They introduced Dr. Mindbender, who would become Cobra's mad scientist. There were some good, solid, military-looking figures released that year, too. But the bright colors and the make-believe weapons were starting to take over, and that trend really took off in 1987 when military-based figures were in the minority. G.I. Joe did swing back to its military roots later, but it was too late for me. I was already out of G.I. Joe by that time. In the last two or three years of the line, they really went to crazy town. Most of the line had very little to do with the reality. Hoodie, your nostalgic perspective! Oh, right, right, my nostalgic perspective. Um, uh, Vintage G.I. Joe it reminds me of the best parts of my childhood. Uh, it's an escape from the stress of adult life. It's something I can be passionate about, but it doesn't hurt anyone. And these vintage figures are survivors. They are playtime veterans. These are the toys that were there for our imaginary battles. As an adult, rediscovering G.I. Joe really helped me through some difficult times. Modern figures couldn't do that. I don't have the connection with them. But holding a vintage figure in my hand, even if it's a figure that I don't like, takes me right back to a good point in my personal history. And that's why I love vintage G.I. Joe. In a way, it kind of saved me. Ah! Hoodie, quick, before it's too late, put sci-fi in the time machine! Hurry, before your arms disappear. Hit it! 